So welcome to this NMC webinar changes with example. Please enjoy and the new test of competence will present the new changes of the CBT and the OSCE for midwives, along with some content examples and the support materials. Towards the end of the session, there will be a QA session where we will have the opportunity to answer some of your questions. Please submit your questions throughout the session so we can do our best to answer this for you. And later on, Jack Blanc will outline what's coming up after the session. Before I hand over to Verena, I would like to give you a brief update on the midwifery demand since we introduced the new the test of competence in November 2014. As you may know, in 2018, we launched the overseas program. Since then, we have seen the number of CBTs taken by midwives significantly increase with the period between April 2019 and March 2020, recording our highest numbers in the last year. The same can also be noted for the OSCE, although figures are smaller. Yeah, I think we've um, we've lost Peter, so I'm Jack Bland. So I think Peter was doing a really helpful job just showing that actually demand is creeping up um, year by year and actually what we're um, forecasting is a, a fair few more midwives coming through the overseas route um, over the next um, year or so. Um, so I think that um, ends Pila's slide. So thanks Pila for your introduction. I'm now going to hand over to Verena, um, our senior uh, midwifery advisor, um, to take you through uh, the changes to our standards. Thanks Verena. Thank you, Jack, and um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to take you on a stop tour of um, the standards of proficiency for midwives, which we uh, published last year in November. And if anyone um, isn't familiar with the standards or would like a, a, a sort of a printable copy, they are available at handouts um, for attached to this presentation um, as um, a PDF. So, um, next slide, please. The um, standards of um, proficiency for midwives are based um, on the Lancet series of midwifery, and that um, concentrates on practice categories, the organisation of care, values, philosophies, and care providers. And along the practice categories, we talk about education information, health promotion, assessment screening and care planning, promotion of normal processes, prevention of complications, and then for childbearing women and infants with complications, there's a need for first-line management uh, and uh, medical and obstetric and sometimes neonatal services and others. So when we translated the Lancet series into standards of proficiency, what we came up with were six interrelated domains and we've done them in a circle because really they they all interlink and they're um, not to be seen sort of um, as hierarchical. So um, domain one covers being an accountable, autonomous professional midwife. Domain two covers safe and effective midwifery care and the key um, issues around providing continuity of care and carer. Universal care for all women and newborn infants is domain three, and that picks up on what's needed for absolutely everybody, including women who have under, under babies who have complications. And then domain four picks up on the specifics around the additional care for women and newborn infants with complications. Domain five is around promoting excellence, and that's about the midwife, colleague, scholar, and leader and the midwife as a skilled practitioner is in domain six. And I suppose what's absolutely key to this is that there are 17 themes that also run throughout the standards. And they cover key themes such as evidence-based care, enabling and advocating for the, for the views, preferences and decisions, optimizing normal processes, providing continuity of care, the importance of um, safety in its broadest sense and anticipating, preventing and responding to complications and additional care needs. But I'll take you through just um, a couple of these in the next slide, please. And what we're looking for and we're aiming for with these standards was transformative change. And absolutely everything is focused on the needs, 
views, preferences and decisions of women and the needs of newborn infants. So that is something that's absolutely knitted through the entire standards. Next slide, please. And when I talked about safety, within these standards, we've gone for a very broad definition of safety. And it's not just about physical safety. It's about the physical safety, psychological safety, social, cultural, and spiritual safety of women and newborn babies. And that, again, is knitted throughout the standards and comes through in all of the domains. And when you look at domain six, you'll see that there are specific um, uh, sections in Domain 6 which look at communication, uh, multidisciplinary working and also there's a specific section around um, assessing and planning and another specific section around um, medications. So we've pulled those out specifically in Domain 6. Next slide please. And the overarching purpose of the transformative change is about understanding the impact that pregnancy, labour and birth, postpartum infant feeding and the early weeks of life can have on longer term health and well-being. And this links into the public health um, side of midwifery and also um, overlapping and uh, feeding into the work that, uh, for example, Marmot has done and the emerging work around the absolute importance of those um, first few weeks and months on um, the longer term uh, health and well-being of um, people. So next slide, please. What we're aiming to do with the midwifery talk is move from the old standards to the new standards. And within this, what we're looking for from the candidates are um, the demonstration of the um, marrying up between theory and practice and the sort of um, approach of graduateness that is implicit um, within the um, standards. I mean, graduateness in inverted commas, but it's, it's that marrying between evidence and um, practice. So really getting to grips with the theory and practice. So what we're looking for is a candidate that can demonstrate an evidence-based approach to midwifery and uh, aligning to the UK um, country policies. And one of the specifics around that is continuity of care and carer. Thinking about optimizing normal physiological processes, recognition of when there's a need to escalate, and the ability of the midwife to continue to coordinate and provide midwifery care working as part of the multidisciplinary team. And that's particularly relevant when you're thinking around domain four and the um, need women who and their babies who need additional care, for example. And also thinking about what the midwife needs to do and be um, very skilled at for the appropriate actions in emergency scenarios. And also um, thinking about the full systematic examination of the newborn. Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who'll take you through the nitty gritty of um, what the new talk will consist of. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to take you through the detail. And there's quite a lot to cover today because we're going to talk about all the different elements, the CBT and the OSCEs um, and a little bit about the support materials. Um, I'm not going to go into the development processes, and I talked about those a little bit in um, the overview presentation, which was also an overview of the midwifery. If people haven't seen that, it would be useful to watch it. Um, there's a little bit more information than I'm going to go into today on the development side, maybe in the nursing APIE video. So if, if people want to check back on things that they haven't seen, but today I'm going to focus specifically on midwifery. And I have with me um, a colleague, Teresa Shalovsky, who's been the lead of our clinical team working on these developments. She's going to come in at the question and answer session as well to take lead on the clinical questions that come up. Um, OK, next slide, please. So this just gives a very brief overview. I'm going to talk about um, 
the design and how it's designed and then give examples of all the different parts of um, the test of competence. And then I think um, Jack or Pilar is going to talk about next steps. If you could move on, please. So this table um, gives a quick overview of the new test of competence for midwifery. So if you look at the second row, um, talks about the CBT part of the test. So the CBT part of the test has a part A numeracy test, which is 15 marks. And candidates will be given 30 minutes to complete that part. And then there's a part B clinical part of the test, which is 100 marks and it's two and a half hours. And I'm going to give some examples of those today. Those two parts will be awarded separately. So it's possible you'll take them both together for the first attempt. But if you fail only the numeracy, you only have to reset the numeracy. And just the same applies to clinical. Uh, the OSCE is going to be from April when we introduce the new test is a 10 station OSCE. So the current OSCE is six stations. So we're increasing the number of stations. Um, there will be a four, four stations linked around a common scenario, the APIE, and that's um, the same model as is in the current test of competence. Um, where we've made more changes is around the skill stations. So there's going to be four skill stations which consist of two pairs of two skills. So that may be linked in some way to just ease the flow for the candidate. But one of the linked skills will always include the systematic examination of the newborn and the postnatal check, both of which are key elements of the new midwifery standards. Um, there'll always be an emergency skill in there as well. And then there's two new written stations, one around professional values and one that's about um, evidence-based practice. And Verena talked about um, the importance of an academic approach integrated with the practical side. So that's an example of, of how we're trying to assess that element of it. And I've got examples of those two stations today as well. The timings vary a little bit um, according to the specific skills. We might uh, tweak things a bit, but generally the assessment station is about 15 minutes for the APIE planning stations, maybe 10 minutes or so, and the evaluation station about 16 minutes. And skill stations generally 16 minutes for a pairing. We're in the process of trialing all of this material. So we're trying to get the balance right between giving you information up front um, as soon as possible so you can start your own planning, but also we're still finalizing some of this. So there might be some slight tweaks. It will definitely be 10 stations and the 10 stations will definitely be as set out here. The timings might still vary a little bit. That kind of thing might still be altered as we go through the trialing process. If you could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so this just gives an overview of what's going to be included in the OSCE. So we have a 10 station OSCE. And if you look along the top row here, you've got APIE. That's the scenarios, uh, the scenario based AP part that, um, to the test. And then there are skill one, skill two, skill three, skill four, skill five the systematic evaluation of the newborn and skill for clinical skill. That's just um, it's just an example of how it might be. And then skill five and skill six will always be professional values and appraising evidence based practice. So the scenarios that we've that we're going to have at or around um, the time that we go live with these materials in April are um, three scenario based 10 station OSCEs. One is abdominal pain, which is um, an updated version of the OSCE that we currently have. And then there's two new scenarios that we're introducing as well, prolonged labour and birth and postnatal visit. So the way this chart works, um, the stations where there is little change are light green. So if you look at the abdominal pain row, the P and the I are light green. They're very similar to what candidates are asked to do now. Um, the mid green, which is the A and the E in the abdom abdominal pain row, those are updated with quite significant changes. It's based on the current scenario, but there's, it's quite different to how it currently works. And then the dark green are new stations. So all of the skill stations 
and two rows for prolonged labour and birth postnatal visit. That's all new content. And this is this will be supplemented and added to over time as well to give a broader coverage. And every 10 station OSCE has been the, the different stations within it have been selected carefully to complement each other and to give a broad range of coverage, but also to be of comparable difficulty across the different OSCEs that we might offer. Could you move on to the next slide, please? OK, so this is I'm just going to talk through these quite quickly. Um, this is some examples from the new numeracy test. So the numeracy test in the new test of competence is different to the current CBT in that candidates have to input a number and in some cases also a unit. Um, the current CBT, all of the questions are multiple choice. So the num numeracy part isn't multiple choice at all. And this is just some examples of the kinds of questions that they might get. Um, they should be fairly straightforward for a midwife who's ready to just go and practice um, in a clinical setting. They're all things, it's all applied numeracy, the kinds of things that a midwife could be expect, could reasonably be expected to do in their day-to-day -day work. So the, this is one of the first ones on the test and it's a very easy one, which is a kind of um, aim to be an easy starter question to get candidates into it before we maybe progress the difficulty a little bit. Uh, can you move on to the next one, please? Um, this one's just um, a part of the test where we're looking at different metric units. Again, another straightforward question. If you could move on, please. There's some questions that are assessing oral medications and calculating different amounts of oral medication to give. Can you move on to the next one, please? And again, a slightly more complicated version of um, the syringe question that we saw at the start. But again, you, might, you probably recognize this is the kind of thing that would be straightforward to a midwife that's doing this on a day to day basis. And it's diff we have parallel questions in the nursing. Um, but the context of these questions is specific to. And then we have questions about intravenous intravenous infusions as well and the next one I think this is the final example of a numeracy question I know I've gone through these quite quickly but you can download the presentation and have a look at these um, this is just completion of a fluid balance chart I think there's one of these in every numeracy test different versions of the same question so those are the numeracy examples and then I'm going to show you some examples of the clinical questions. In the CBT presentation that I gave earlier, um, I talked about how we design the scene as we think appropriate to the different domains and how every question is targeted at a specific domain, but also within a statement within that domain so that we can ensure that across the whole bank of questions, we've got broad coverage. Um, they're also written to assess different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's taxonomy is something that we use in assessment development to show um, the level of cognitive demand of questions. So within every clinical test, there'll be some questions at the lower levels of Bloom. So this is the lowest levels, remembering and understanding. But there'll also be some that are assessed things like application of knowledge, and then also um, the higher levels as well. So I've got some examples of the questions at different levels. So this one, um, how does a midwife ensure a woman who's breastfeeding receives appropriate support? Choose one answer. And they're all designed to have one correct answer, three incorrect answers. We always avoid um, what I would call single best answer questions. So where there's maybe it's nuanced, but there's multiple that could be right, but one's better than the others. We try to avoid that because it's just less straightforward for the candidates to do. So this one is assessing domain two, but within that domain, it's statement number one. And it's at Bloom's level of remember and understand. Can you move on to the next one? 
Oh, and I should have said that the, I'm sure you've realised that the one that's highlighted in green is the correct answer. Um, so again, just another example of a clinical question that this, uh, a midwife might see in their computer-based test. This one is domain number one, statement 19, and it's at the apply and analyse level of Bloom's taxonomy. And then if you move on to the next one, thank you. Um, so this one's at the highest level of Bloom, which is create and evaluate, um, assessing domain four, statement 4.4. I'll just give you a minute to read it through. Okay, next slide, please. I know I'm whizzing through these a bit, but um, I wanted to actually give a little bit more time for the OSCE stations, um, which have maybe had more significant changes. So, if, if you remember the grid that I showed, I showed that even for the um, scenario that's currently used, the assessment part of that um, APIE has had quite a significant change. Um, so we no longer give the five minutes reading time. The reading has been reduced and is integrated within the station itself. And the candidates provided with a briefing. Um, and we're very clear that the candidate can write notes, but the notes aren't assessed. Anything that the candidate says is not assessed, but as part of the station, they have to complete the news chart and calculate a news score, and that's what we assess. So if you move on to the next slide, please. As part of the reading, they're given this um, scenario about the patient as background. It's a lot shorter than the current reading but it has all of the information. This is just an extract. It's a little bit longer than this. And if you move on to the next slide, please. And these are the criteria against which the candidate will be assessed. So these will be published. So there aren't any surprises. You know exactly what um, we're going to be looking for to award a pass or fail for the candidate. Um, this should be reasonably familiar to you and is fairly similar to what we currently assess the assessment stations against. So if you move on to the next slide, please. This is just an example of the planning. So in that grid, I showed that the planning stations have actually had very few changes. So this is very similar to how we assess the planning as part of the current APIE. Um, so the candidate is presented with a scenario. And if you can move on to the next slide, please. And then they're giving, given a task. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to read it. So on this one, um, what's being assessed is a verbal handover. And again, whatever they write, they're given uh, paper to write notes and things, but they're not um, assessed on what they verbalize. And if you move on to the next slide, please, it gives the criteria against which the candidates will be assessed. Okay, could you move on to the next slide, please? So again, the implementation um, station is very similar to the current implementation station. So again, uh, the candidates are given a scenario. It's the same patient, but moved on to the next stage of their care. Um, and the candidate is asked to administer and document all required two o'clock medications for the patient in a safe and professional manager, manner. 
move on to the next slide, please. And again, this is actually, I think I've pasted the wrong criteria in there. I think that's the criteria from the planning one. So I'll have to, if, can you go back one? Yeah, okay. If you move on, I think we went backwards actually. I was getting confused. In the implementation, um, we have you, we are using a new drugs chart, so it's not the same as the drugs chart that's in the current stations. And this is because we did an audit of drugs charts um, that are in use around in different clinical settings, and we felt that the drugs chart that we were using didn't reflect what was commonly being used. So we've updated our drugs chart and we'll include an example of the new drugs, drugs chart in the support materials so the candidates can familiarise themselves with that. And if you move on to the next slide, please, this one should be the assessment criteria for the implementation station. And if you can move on again, please. So the evaluation station is the final station in this four station set around the common scenario. And again, the same patient at the next stage of their treatment. And for this one, the candidate is asked, um, they're given the scenario again and asked to complete a transfer of care letter to the community midwife. And if you move on to the next slide, please. That's the assessment criteria against which that will be judged. OK, so that's that's the examples of the APIE part of the 10 station OSCE. I'm going to move on and give a couple of examples from the skill stations. So if you could move on to the next slide, please. And the next one. So um, Raina talked in the, uh, about the new standards, asking for a systematic examination of the newborn. So we will have elements of this in all of the 10 station OSCEs. So again, for this one, the candidate will be given a scenario. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to read this through. And I know there's been quite a lot of debate among our clinical teams, which I'm sure Ter Teresa can help with much more than I can around the use of the NIPE. Um, but this that is something that will be included in the new OSCE. And the candidates asked to require actions to undertake a systematic examination of the baby. Can you move on to the next one, please. So something that's changed with the um, skill stations is that for each skill station, we will provide a list of resources that provide the evidence that underpin that skill station and what we're looking for as part of that skill station. So this, um, this is what the candidates should read it as part of their preparation. In some, for some of the skill stations, there might be two or three different references for this one, there's just the one reference. And where there's two or three different ones, we know that it, there may be slight differences in, in what they say in the different evidence. And we've kind of done that intentionally because there is this range of what's um, out there, even in what's the good practice. Um, and it might be a useful part of teaching and learning to talk through any differences in the evidence where there are multiple resources um, provided. So for every skill station that we are going to include in the OSCE, there will be a reference list provided that you can use for preparation. 
And then if you move on to the next slide, we do give very clear marking criteria. So even if we've given three different resources and maybe they have slightly different emphasis on different elements in the evidence, we, we're going to publish all of the marking criteria so that you know exactly what's going to be looked for when the assessors are making their judgments. And those are the marking criteria for, the, for this particular skill station. The assessment criteria for the APIE, generally the assessment criteria for the assessment part of that will always be the same. And the assessment criteria for all the planning ones will generally be similar. The skill stations have criteria specific to them, but they will all be published. If you could move on, please. So I said that there's two new um, written stations. So we had a lot of debate about these, but we felt that there's some key parts of the new standards that we wanted to pull out and assess in their own right and to ensure that all of the candidates are assessed on these things. So one of them is around behaving in, in, in line with set professional val values as set out in the code and in the, in the standards. So an example of this, we give a scenario um, generally where there's an ethical issue that's come up. Um, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to read this one through. And then the task that the candidate will be asked to do is given in the two bullet points at the end. So using your knowledge of the code, consider the professional, ethical and legal implications of the scenario. And then summarise the actions you would take in bullet points. So it is a written task. We don't need prose, just a list of bullet points. Um, and this is an eight minute station to do to read the scenario and to write a bullet point list of actions and if you move on to the next slide please again this is the assessment criteria and these will be published so people understand what's expected as part of these professional values stations and um, so we're developing a series of new professional values Stations that cover a range of different scenarios that might come up and new ones will be added over time as well. And then if you move on to the next slide, please. So the other new written station is around evidence-based practice. So for this type of station, the candidate's given two things to read. And there's one on this slide and one on the following slide. So they're given a scenario, but they're also given a summary of some evidence from an academic article that relates to that scenario. And what the candidate is asked to do is identify the main points from the academic literature to answer the question that's given in the scenario. So they're working in the community, have an appointment with Hannah, um, she wants to talk about whether the midwife or obstetrician can manually protect her perineum. So in this context, a midwife may go and have a look at the research evidence. So if you move on to the next slide. We give a brief summary. It's only an eight minute station, so we could, couldn't give too much information, but we give a summary of some academic literature on this topic. And the candidate points of information from this to answer the question that the patient was asking in the scenario. And if you move on to the next slide, please. Again, we publish the criteria showing how we would assess the responses to this. And again, it, we're asking for bullet points. 
So if you could move on to the next slide, please. I've got one very brief slide, um, which is just an overview of the support materials. Um, so all of the examples that I've shown today are materials that we've developed to publish as part of the support that we're giving to um, trusts and candidates in advance of the new test of competence going live next April. So these support materials should be available um, at the beginning of February. The CBT materials will be available actually in the assessment system that's used for the live test. So it's in the peers and view system. So the candidate can have a proper practice of use of answering questions like this in the assessment engine that they'll use for their real tests. Um, the support materials for the OSCEs that I've shown will be in the learning platforms held by each of the test centres. So Northampton have their Nile site and Ulster and OBU have their Blackboard and their Moodle sites. The materials will be available there. I gave more information about the support materials in the overview presentation, which was the first one of these presentations. So if you want to go back and have a look at that webinar, there's more information about the support materials there. OK, sorry, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour of the new um, test of competence for midwives, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So we're going to move on to the question and answer session. So I think everyone who's on the panel is going to put their video on and we're going to do our best to answer your questions. Thanks, um, Sarah, and thank you also to Verena for um, your presentations. They were really, really helpful, and I hope um, members of the uh, the group found found it useful too. So we've got a little bit of time um, to take some questions. Um, as Sarah said and Alex at the beginning, if we don't get to your questions today, please don't worry. Um, we'll come back to you separately, and we'll publish um, anything um, on our website in terms of uh, the responses to the questions that we don't get to. Um, so we've got Sonia, um, part of my team. She's busy collating all the questions. So can we have the first one, please, Sonia? Hello. Yes, sure. We haven't had that many questions, but we've got a, a, a few. So the first one is, if fluid balance charts will be tested at CBT stage, does that mean there will no longer be a skill at OSCE stage? Sarah, do you want to kick off and then maybe over to Teresa? It definitely doesn't mean that. So the CBT, um, we try and cover quite a wide range of things. They're one mark questions. They're quite superficial, but we can assess a lot of breadth, but not very deeply. So there's certain things that would come up on the CBT. Um, they might, we might choose to go into the same thing in more depth in an OSCE station. It's not to say that there's definitely an OSCE station on that. Um, but there certainly are lots of examples where something's tested on the CBT and also tested on the OSCE, but they're slightly different things. CBT is superficial breadth, and then the OSCE is used to go into things in much more detail. Thanks. So, Sharisa, do you have anything before we move on? Um, yes. Just wanted to say really that um, we would use a fluid balance chart. I mean, the skills stations are scenarios, so we would use it if if it if it formed an integral part of the scenario. But we wouldn't have um, we're not we're not planning at the moment to have a skill station where it was just developing um, completing a fluid balance chart. What we're actually looking for is alignment to the NMC standards. So we're looking for something broader uh, than that. So tasks that are part of the day-to-day -day work of the midwife that enables her to meet the standards, yes, we would have them, but actually we're, the remit is quite big. So it would just form one part of care. Um, I hope that makes sense, rather than having specific uh, skill stations that look at specific skills, they would be, we, would, we would include it if it was integral. Great, that's really helpful and a really good question. Thanks very much. Um, can we have another one, please, Sonia? Sure. Does midwifery have the same number of attempts per application than the nursing pathways do? Do you want to take that one, Sarah? I can see you nodding. Yes. The, um, it works in the same way as the nursing one. 
Great. So no change. Um, over to you, Sonia, for another one. Will midwifery, CBT and OSCE go live at the same time than nursing? Thank you, Sonia. Sarah, do you want to take that one? So there's three strands to the new test of competence. There's the strand for nursing, there's a strand for midwifery, and then there's a strand for nursing associates as well. Um, the nursing and midwifery new tests are both going live next April. Um, the exact date in April is still to be agreed, but it will be next April. Um, the nursing associate one will go, will go live later. Um, so yes, nursing and midwifery are being done in parallel and will be introduced at the same time. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Another one, please, um, Sonia. I think we've got a little bit more time. Will there be specific preparation materials for the midwifery talk, both for CBT and OSCE? I think Sarah can answer that one. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. So all of the examples that I've given today, um, the numeracy ones, the CB, uh, the clinical ones, and the OSCE, that's all taken from the support materials. And I hope you could see as I was going through that these are midwifery specific ones. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll all be, um, as Sarah said, they'll all be published. Um, we'll, you'll see some things on our website um, early next year, around uh, end of January, beginning of February, which will detail things like the specification that um, Alpha Plus have used to design the test alongside the blueprint. And then a little bit later, you'll be seeing um, some of the preparation um, materials that Sarah's shared today. So yeah, it's all coming uh, likely to be the end of uh, January, beginning of Feb. Thanks very much for the question. Can we have another one, please? Will this be used for return to practice midwives? Yeah, really good question. Um, just thinking, Sarah, do you want to take that? So the test of competence is designed to be set at a standard um, that it, any candidate who passes it is ready to go and, and work safely in clinical practice. So if you can pass this test, then you are suitable to go into clinical practice at that level. Um, so in some ways, it doesn't matter which route you've come up through. It could be return to practice. It could be um, international candidates. Um, as long as you can pass this test, then you're safe to go into clinical practice. So yes, we're going to use this same test for candidates on both of those routes. Great. And, and that applies for adult nursing too, um, for those of you that are looking after that area. Thanks very much, Sarah. A um, couple of more minutes. Anything else, um, Sonia, from, from the questions? Um, will there be an equipment list available specifically for midwifery? Yeah, so a really good question. We've had that on some of the other webinars. Do you want to take that one, Sarah? Yes, there'll be an equipment list. So everything that we're doing for nursing will be available specifically for midwifery as well. And then a little bit down the line will be available specifically for nursing associates too. And um, from memory. Yeah, we're trying to be fair for all the candidates. So we don't want to provide something for nurses that we don't then provide for midwives or vice versa. So everyone gets the same set of support materials. And from memory, Sarah, that will be ready um, end of January, beginning of February, in line with all of the rest of the support. Lovely. I can see Sarah nodding. Thanks very much, Sarah. Another one, please, Sonia. For the CBT, if midwives pass the numeracy test and fail clinical questions, do they need to attend both tests or one only one that they fail on? So I'll give Sarah a break. It will just be the one that they fail. So if they pass the numeracy but fail the clinical area, they'll just need to sit that one paper. They won't need to do both. Thank you, Sonia. Can we have another one, please? Will there be a train the trainer sessions for midwifery? Yeah, so another good question. Sarah, do you want to take that one? There will be. We, um, we don't have the dates for them yet, but in the new year, there'll be some train the trainer sessions. Yeah, so yeah. they'll be running in the same way as we've done train the trainer um, before. But as Sarah said, what we need to do is get the test centres 
up to speed with the new materials. And again, uh, we'll be we'll be rolling out something uh, for for those people that are interested next year. So yeah, lots more to come. So keep an eye on that. Thanks, Sonia. Have we got any more questions? They seem to be coming in. Yes. Um, is the marking scheme going to change from the current marking scheme? Yeah, so I think the answer to that question is yes, um, but over to Sarah to explain it. I thought I might pass that one to Teresa. She's much more <laughs> familiar with the new markings, with the marking schemes and things than I am. Great. Thanks, Teresa. Um, well, as Sarah said, we're obviously trialling um, these at the moment. So whatever data we get back might um, indicate a change. I think one of the things that we've also looked at is the use and the marking criteria of, um, for example, SVAR. And uh, we, we needing to future proof this. So, so you might see changes that say using a clear, um, concise, structured communication tool. Um, that that will be so we'll change it if the feedback suggests that actually we need to change it um, but we're also looking at future proofing it a little bit as well um, it doesn't mean to say that, that the, the candidate might not be given an, a muse chart or, or an s bar um, but looking to the future uh, as practice develops what we don't want to be doing is being plugged into something that actually um, is no longer being used out in practice so the short answer is yes the long answer is also uh, yes, but I, I would imagine from Sarah's perspective, we want to get this right as soon as possible so that we're not making big changes all the time. Thanks very much, Theresa. Anything you want to add, Sarah, before we move on? No, I think that's I think that's fine. And just, I guess, to say again that there will be there will be examples of marking schemes published as part of the support materials, so people get a chance to familiarise themselves with the approach that we're. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I've got a couple of more minutes, probably, Sonia, for a couple of more questions before we bring the session to a close. Sure. Um, a question has just come through. If the talk is used for our return to practice midwives, will there be guidance regarding preparation programmes prior to taking the talk? For example, if a midwife has been off the register for an extended period. Good question. Um, Sarah, do you want to help with that one or do you want us to take it? Yeah, um, so I think we've had lots of feedback around um, the levels of preparation and, and that's something we're absolutely looking at um, for next year. I mean, some of the things we're doing is looking at our website in terms of where people go to find the information about the, the talk on the one side of things, but also the return to practice. So we are looking at improving what we give um, um, candidates um, next year. Um, so, yeah, it's on our list of things to look at, um, but I think it's a, it's a really good question. Um, anybody got anything to add to that? Verena, do you want to come in with anything? I think you might be on mute. Uh, yes, Jack, I think it's... Oh, sorry. Lovely, we can hear you. Thanks, Verena. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's a very good, very, very good question, and it picks up on um, a couple of points, which is really that preparation is going to be key. And if somebody is coming back into practice, they need to think whether they um, want to do a return to practice program or whether it would be better for them to do a talk um, and um, with the CBT and the OSCE um, sort of components. And I think that that's a discussion in advance of um, putting yourself uh, through either and um, for somebody who's just been out of clinical practice for a little while and are slightly missing out on ours because for example had a series of pregnancies um, they haven't been out of clinical practice really for that long the talk and um, going down that route may well be the best way for them to um, get back into practice and of course the the sort of talk overall is valid for five years so it's a very good um, way of doing things if you haven't been out of clinical practice for that long if you've been out for slightly longer you might want to consider the return to practice program and of course those are approved in the same way as all our programs are approved um, 
via via our um, partners. So um, I hope that sort of helps. But as Jack says, there's going to be a lot of information available and um, sort of things that people can practice with and all the um, resources that um, Sarah and, and Teresa have talked about. And that brings me back to the point about preparing in advance. Um, this, as you've seen from today's presentation, is not easy peasy. It's uh, very straightforward if you've, you're an experienced midwife and you've been in practice and um, you're very familiar with all of this, but it's not um, something that you can just, um, I think, do without doing a certain amount of preparation, being very familiar with the new standards, very familiar with things like um, duty of candor and so on. And those sorts of things do take time and preparation. But um, as you can see, um, it's, it's straightforward and uh, a lot of it is very, very familiar and will be very familiar if, if you've um, been a midwife and our midwife in clinical practice. Thanks, Verena. That's really, really helpful. Um, I think we've got time for one more question before we bring the uh, session to a close. So one more, please, Sonia. Will there be real patients or actors for APIE stations or a mannequin? Teresa, do you want to take that one first and then maybe Sarah can come in if she's got anything to add? Um, the answer to that is it, it depends uh, really on the um, on what we're trying to um, achieve here. So um, I think I think the answer is that that would be ideal um, to have real actors, um, but it's um, certainly for some of our OSCE stations there are not there won't be real actors there. There may be just a doll and a pelvis. Um, for example, for, for the emergency um, skills. So it completely depends on what we're trying to um, achieve. I don't know if Sarah wants to add anything. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, so I would just add that, yes, some stations have an actor, some stations have a mannequin, and it depends, as Teresa says, based on what's most appropriate in that context. Um, the only other thing we have to take bear in mind at the moment is coronavirus um, and social distancing. So with the existing test of competence at the moment, we're not using actors um, and we have to come up with alternative ways of doing things, even where an actor is the ideal way. Um, but if it involves certainly contact and things, then we're not doing that at the moment. So hopefully by the time this goes live next April, we're not going to have to worry about that. But um, we're not sure. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Teresa, and thanks, Verena. So I think that brings us um, to a nice um, point to wrap up.